Therefore, on the occasion of the European Day Against Islamophobia, it's essential that institutions recognize the existence of the problem and start building a proper strategy in order to put an end to the different forms of discrimination and Islamophobia and to ensure the security to the Muslim community and the equal rights to every citizen. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, invite our colleague, Antonio Bancora, so. who's the head of international unit at the FA Daily, um, to complete the opening remarks. Thank you. So good morning, and uh, thank you for coming uh, to these uh, EU policy talks. I am Antonio Bancora, and uh, I'm the head of international unit of Fondazione Albero della Vita which is um, an Italian NGO based uh, in uh, Milan. First of all, let me say thank you to everybody, to the EU representatives, to MAPS, who are going to participate uh, to this uh, EU policy talk, to FEMSO, thanks a lot, and to all partners of the project MEET. Uh, I hope uh, that this time uh, together can inspire us uh, uh, around the way to challenge Islamophobia and all together working for a more uh, tolerant uh, Europe. As uh, she said, Islamophobia is a symptom of disintegration of human rights. Consequently, we cannot accept Islamophobia anymore uh, in Europe because uh, it is against uh, EU values. That's why uh, Fondazione Albero della Vita decided to implement uh, the project Meet with all partners. And a uh, few words about this project. In the last uh, two years, we increased citizen participation uh, and we discussed the issue of, uh, of Islamophobia to raise awareness about that. We increase the engagement of uh, civil society and we empower youth as agents of change. And we uh, discuss a lot with uh, policymakers and decision makers in order to forward uh, recommendations from the bottom. So uh, to conclude, thank you again to everybody and enjoy the rest uh, of the talk. Thank, thank you so much. much. Um, um, as Antonio and Hibba both mentioned, um, this is a very proud moment for both our organizations and I'm sure all of the meet partners um, who are joining us online if they can't join us presently. Um, key element that I'd like to remind everyone if they can, um, please do tweet the event and there is a specific hashtag that civil society organizations across Europe will be using today, which is EUDAI21 which is the European Day Against Islamophobia 21. Um, please do tweet the event, and um, we are, of course, very happy to see engagement from everyone who is joining us. I am now very lucky to be able to introduce um, our keynote address. The keynote address will be done by uh, Her Excellency Helena Daly, the European Commissioner for Equality. Um, uh, I'm just going to check with our tech team whether that's done. Okay. So she to stop speaking. Okay. Just to check. Um, Commissioner, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Excellent. I would uh, like to invite you to begin. Okay. Thank you. So I'm very pleased to mark the European Day of Action against anti-Muslim discrimination with you today. The effects of the coronavirus on minority groups have brought to light how vulnerable minority individuals and communities actually are. False news scapegoating Muslims or migrants for starting or spreading the virus remind us of dark times in our Europe European history. 
Incidents of racism, xenophobia, discrimination, and intolerance targeting minorities have occurred in most EU member states. Governments must publicly condemn, act against, and sanction such racist acts. In my intervention last year, I underlined the Commission's engagement to fight against racism, hatred, and discrimination faced by Muslims, since data continues to point to the high rates of Muslim communities in Europe are, are facing. The 2019 EU Eurobarometer on discrimination shows that about three in 10 persons will not feel fully comfortable to work with a Muslim person as a colleague. And in general, about half of Europeans believe that discrimination based on religion or beliefs is widespread in their country. According to FRA surveys, Muslim women, more than Muslim men, cite the way they dress as the main reason for discrimination when looking for work. Real or perceived intolerance, hatred and discrimination risks breaking down, risk breaking down the bank of trust that Muslim citizens have in our public and democratic institutions. In the same vein, we must ensure that policies in other areas, such as, for instance, in the field of security and anti-terrorism, firmly respect fundamental rights and do not stigmatize or disproportionately target members of specific communities. We cannot afford to run this risk. Muslims have been victim to such violations over the past years, and we have to reject this. We are all here today to find the joint solutions and approaches to fighting discrimination on ethnic and religious grounds. As you know, in the EU, we have solid legislation in place forbidding any type of discrimination targeting minorities. Last year was the 20th anniversary of two important directives. The Racial Equality Directive provides an extensive framework for combating racial or ethnic discrimination in all spheres of life. And the Employment Equality Directive prohibits discrimination based on religion or beliefs among other grounds in the area of employment and training. Our recent application report adopted in March confirmed a general sentiment that little progress has been made in the fight, made in the fight against discrimination. The main challenges include fear of reporting incidents of discrimination, low levels of compensation issued at national level, difficulties in pro proving a case of discrimination, and a lack of awareness of rights and support mechanisms. The report identifies possible avenues to address these challenges, which include strengthening the equality bodies, ensuring adequate sanctions, or improving equality data collection. By the end of this year, the Commission will present an initiative to modify the treaties and add hate speech and hate crime, whether because of race, religion, gender, or sexual orientation, as a euro crime. Once supported by member states, this development will help us be more incisive in our legislative framework against hate crime and hate speech. Aside from the legislation, I signal the successes of some non-legislative policy initiatives, which are crucial to tackle anti-Muslim discrimination. With the diversity charters, the commission is fostering diversity in the workplace by encouraging voluntary initiatives by businesses. To date, more than 12,000 businesses in 24 member states have signed up. Last year, the Commission adopted the EU Anti-Racism Action Plan 2020-2025, which includes a focus on anti-Muslim hatred as a form of racism and encourages action. In particular, the Action Plan aims to tackle more structural forms of racism and address conscious and unconscious biases that contribute to intolerance, hated, hatred, and discrimination. The Commission has nominated a new coordinator on anti-racism and a team to fight racism is being built. We have also created a member state subgroup to work on the guidelines for the development of national action plans against racism. 
Furthermore, we are now in the process of nominating a new coordinator on combating anti-Muslim hatred. Coordinator will continue to be in charge of ensuring an overarching approach by different commission services, from hate crime policy to non-discrimination and policies in the area of security and education and youth. We aim to ensure a comprehensive response and we are conscious that when dealing with anti-Muslim hatred, we cannot exclusively focus on religious discrimination. The discri this intersectional discrimination is often at play with reference to gender, migration status, skin color, and other aspects. For that specific priorities in the funding, we make available every year through the new Citizens Equality Rights and Values Program, we are set to promote inclusion of Muslims, access to employment and education of Muslim women, and the tackling of anti-Muslim hatred. Today's conference, which is also being held in the context of the project meet, which is financed by the Commission, is an excellent example of how EU funding can support civil society in the fight against Muslim hatred. Dear friends, as stated by President von der Leyen, fighting racism will never be an option in the European Union. This is more than words and the Commission is acting. We will work closely with civil society and national authorities to monitor the implementation of the anti-racism action plan and enable progress. You can count on me as your ally. And I look forward to continuing our cooperation. I thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for those really poignant and, and really a succinct explanation and, and overview of the work that the Commission and European leaders are doing to tackle this issue. Um, we are very proud, of course, to host you once again. Um, last year was a pleasure, and this year is also a pleasure. Um, from, a, from a practical perspective, it's also incredible to hear that the, that the uh, coordinator on anti-Muslim hatred is now being recruited. We look forward to engaging with them and engaging with yourself and continuing to engage with yourself to really work towards a Europe um, that is, of course, inclusive, diverse, and cohesive. And, and I thank you for your presence and your attendance today. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, now, I would like to uh, move on to the policymakers panel that we have um, speaking. Um, first will be um, MEP uh, Brando Benefai, who is a supporter of Project Me, who will outline the work that, uh, that has been done by our incredible partners to engage with him in order to recognize and, and actually work on an institutional level against gender Islamophobia in a manner that is cohesive and, of course, um, done um, in order to benefit and engage with Muslim women fundamentally. Um, is that all right? Yes. Hi. Hello. Hi. Nice to hear from you. Can you hear me? We can hear, we can hear you perfectly. We'll okay. I, I, I just have, I see that uh, I, I think I have a... a, a a problem with the with the vid stability of the video, so I prefer to speak without it if it's possible, uh, because I, I otherwise I, I suspect the connection will have some problems. Uh, I yeah, of course please do. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, so um, I I want to thank you very much for inviting me. I'm sorry that uh, in fact I'm moving around today. We have a an electoral campaign in Italy uh, ongoing. Uh, in fact, where a lot of these issues are being debated. So, uh, as I said, I'm moving around. I have some problem with the connection, but I hope you can, uh, I can give a, a, a good uh, contribution anyway. Uh, this is European Day against Islamophobia, and I want to thank uh, Femiso again, with whom I, we worked a lot already in these years, and also the Association Albero della Vita for coordinating the project uh, MEET, a more equal Europe together, co-funded by the European Union with a crucial goal of preventing Islamophobia against women and girls in Europe. Uh, this is only the last episode of a great journey represented by this project, and it's an honor for me to take part in it, and I hope that uh, we will have other occasions soon also in person. 
uh, since the first time I received uh, the proposal of signing the statement, I had no doubt about it. To me, it's supporting this cause represents a courageous and fundamental choice as a member of the European Parliament and as a European citizen. Women and girls in Europe experience too often discrimination in the workplace and in everyday life simply because of what they are. In addition to this gender and identity-based phenomenon, another type of discrimination uh, regarding women is occurring in Europe. It's Islamophobia. Islamophobia intervenes in, uh, in a way of, uh, uh, that creates an intersectional discrimination based also on religion and ethnicity towards women and girls which are mu Muslim or they simply come from countries recognized as being Muslim. This is important to underline, I think. Uh, the events happening every day in our countries, all the information we receive from associations and NGOs and from documents and reports, such as the, uh, um, the one on the European network against racism, tells us one simple but crucial thing. The fight against all types of discrimination, in particular sexism, Islamophobia and gendered Islamophobia, must be at the top of the political agenda at the European and national level. Gendered Islamophobia teaches us that it is necessary to fight not only sexism, misogyny and Islamophobia in general, but also a third form of discrimination, which implies these elements altogether. Gender equality policy in the EU has gained momentum. In the past uh, uh, few years, we heard also from the Commissioner Dali, the European Commission, the Parliament and the Council have increasingly prioritized the advancement of equality between men and women, recently building a dedicated gender equality uh, uh, strategy. Under the leadership of von der Leyen, we have been presented with the first ever gender balanced college of commissioners and the creation of a commissioner for equality, as we just heard before me. Uh, the EU gender equality strategy 2020-2024, I think, is a key pillar regarding uh, all these topics we are debating. The explicit dedication of, to the application of an intersectional lens in all gender equality policy. The acknowledgement that gender stereotypes often work in tandem with other stereotypes, including those based on race and recognition of barriers to employment faced by certain women due to additional marginalization, including belonging to religious and ethnic uh, uh, minorities. These words denote positive steps towards the recognition of the problems and the inclusion of racialized women living in Europe. However, there is still much to be done. This is because a great part of the work still depends on member states, and it's difficult to know who, how they will implement this ambitious plan. Considering in tandem the ever-increasing backlash against gender equality and LGBTI uh, rights, as well as the heightened racist political rhetoric from politicians and the media, it is necessary then to consider the challenges to implementing policies that addresses the issues faced by racialized women. As an MEP, I'm a member of the European Parliament Anti-Racism and Diversity uh, Intergroup, which is engaged with the fight against Islamophobia since long time. In the European Parliament, we are working on these issues also as SND group, and I would like here to bring to your attention the letter sent to the President von der Leyen on the occasion of the September State of the Union process by our group with our key political priorities up until 2024. In this regard, the priority number seven is very clear. It's necessary to have a framework directive to prevent and combat all forms of gender-based violence, to complement the Istanbul Convention and the current national legal frameworks, whose weaknesses in tackling the matter have been exposed during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have finally underlined how such an initiative should go hand in hand with the unblocking of the anti-discrimination directive, either through a revised proposal or an enhanced cooperation procedure. I can assure you that we will continue working on this also with the president uh, of the anti-racist winter group, uh, uh, colleague Evin Inchiro, now to propose a resolution in the European Parliament calling for legislation to specifically target gendered Islamophobia and protect Muslim women's rights. Uh, and this engagement will be shared also with the, with the Commission. So to conclude, I, I, I want to also add that uh, I will uh, uh, um, uh, push to the, for the Council to adopt the proposal for a Council directive on implementing the principle of equal treatment between persons irrespective of religion or belief, disability, age or sexual orientation. So again, uh, as, I, as I, I already recalled, and I think also that apart from this legislative work, it's important that we build a working group looking at the specific media uh, 
uh, actions regarding Muslim women, because we know that it's also a cultural issue. It's not just legislation. It's not just a political action. We need to create dialogue and understanding. I'm sure that we will continue working with Femiso and Albero de la Vita on all this. We have been doing in these years, and I know your commitment and your great work uh, on fighting multiple discriminations. So I would like to thank you very much for this uh, occasion. And I will uh, try to stay a little, but uh, as I said, I have some problems with connection, so I might not be able to continue, but uh, uh, I hope uh, that we will have soon other occasions. And I know other colleagues will also address. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brando, for um, those really, really important intervention points. Um, it's great to have a, a MEP like yourself in the European Parliament who is actively engaging on this topic, and we look forward to working with you, as you've mentioned, in future on this incredibly key issue for us, and we look forward to engaging, like I said, both in person and online once again. Um, I will now move on to um, Malcolm Jallo. Um, Malcolm? is the general reporter on racism and intolerance in Europe um, as part of the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly. Um, he is part of the Parliamentary Assembly as a MP from Sweden, and I would like him to address the meeting if possible. I'm not sure whether he is able to hear us. He is able to hear us. So I will uh, now let him begin his remarks. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I can hear you, and I hope you can hear me well. Um, Please let me uh, use this opportunity to thank you for inviting me and for organizing this very important um, seminar. Um, I, I, I'm very, I'm very, I feel privileged uh, to take part in this seminar because this is a very important day um, where we discuss um, an urgent issue that needs to be discussed, that needs to, um, the narrative needs to change and we as politicians need to make sure that we go from words to action. Um, so I want to thank you for this opportunity, and I want to thank uh, the Commissioner and the previous speaker for, for, for really um, showing their commitment into this work. As you know, Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights protects the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Uh, and also, this the same right when it comes to non-discrimination is embodied in Article 14 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So this is something that applies to everybody, not only people that are non-Muslims, but also Muslims included. It applies to everyone. So when we talk about Islamophobia, um, you know, um, it may be viewed as a form of discrimination based on religious belief only. It is important to underline that Muslims are often subjected to a process of racialization, which leads them to, a, to be perceived as separate ethnic group, uh, to the point that when you have, for example, a, a white person who converts to become a Muslim, they don't see the person as real Muslim because they're white. Uh, and this is this uh, racialization process is ongoing. Um, we also see the prejudice against Muslims permeates European societies and um, based on misconceptions such as the idea that Islam is going to take over Europe. We've seen that in almost every European country. And we also see that the misconception that the idea that Islam is non-compatible to European values and that the process of Islamization of our continent is ongoing. This non-compatibility is something that we see in every European country. Um, the, at least the narrative that Islam is non-compatible. In a political landscape that we see right now that is characterized by the rise of racist and xenophobic movements and political parties, um, such misconceptions are often instrumentalized to trigger division within society and sow the seeds of hate for political gain. We've seen a lot of our political leaders use this rhetoric in order to get political gain around Europe. And furthermore, this kind of discourse tends to spread from extremist movements to mainstream political parties, which is a reason for serious concern, considering that the countering countering intolerance and promoting peaceful living together should be the top priority for all forces across the political spectrum. Islamophobia is on the rise in Europe. I think we would all agree on that. And while all Muslims and those who are perceived as Muslims may face this form of discrimination, women are especially and particularly vulnerable to it. In particular, women who wear headscarves are immediately recognized or recognizable as Muslims and easily targeted by Islamophobic bias and attacks. So the gender-based 
aspect of Islamophobia is central. Because Islamophobia is often, and that, that's the reason why Islamophobia is often described as gendered form of racism, and that Muslim women are disproportionately affected by it. They face a challenging situation resulting from multiple and intersectional discrimination on grounds of gender, on grounds of religious belief, on the grounds of ethnic origin, on the grounds of migration background, on social status, and you can go on and on. Um, so we have and continue to witness this among, among other things, legislation banning religious symbols and dress in some Council of Europe member states, severely affecting Muslim women wearing the scarf. I, I, um, I'm very happy that the, the, the commissioner Dali talks about, you know, um, Europe, the commission's increasingly prioritizing gender equality and anti-racism, but we have to move away from uh, the statements to action. We need to really make sure that when we talk about gender equity, it means not only white women, but it means every woman and that Muslim women are included. So I will, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a report now uh, on Islamophobia uh, for the Council of Europe. And I will devote special attention in my report on countering Islamophobia and anti-Muslim hatred to Muslim women in Europe. And will relay information both on their situation and on legislation policies and the measures adopted by the Council of Europe member states to combat discrimination. That is going to be a main focus in my report. We also have the NI report um, that I think uh, my colleague, former colleague um, Julie is gonna talk about. We talks about forgotten women, uh, the impact of Islamophobia and Muslim women based on a research project carried out in eight Western European countries. And that, that report is particularly important and useful um, in this debate. The bans on head uh, covering introduced by several Council of Europe countries affect Muslim women disproportionately. And this is something we need to, it's one thing that we all, when we speak, we have great statements about gender equity. And it's another thing, whilst we speak, we take the other, we, we move out from these beautiful um, um, speeches and then we go to our own parliament and then we have laws and, 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 and policies that would infringe on the very rights that we claim to protect. It's not acceptable. So on the European Action Day against Islamophobia, I call on all European legislators and policymakers to consistently abide by the principles of equality and non-discrimination in their actions, in all the actions, and to pay special attention to the intersection of gender and religion as grounds for discrimination. Whenever we're making legislation, that has to be um, included, that perspective. It is crucial to avoid obstacles that may hinder women's empowerment and opportunities within the Muslim community and in our societies at large. Um, today, this morning, I issued a statement on the occasion of the European Action Day Against Islamophobia, published on the website on the, the Council of Europe. Um, and this is a very important day for me, and, and it's important that we support this day. So um, apart from preparing the report, we need to make sure that my, my main objective preparing the report is to make sure that we make visible the realities of, of, of Muslim, especially Muslim women. And that is something that I intend to do. The European Commission Against Racism, uh, as you know, ACRI is a part of uh, um, um, the, the work that we do. And they have also been working on Islamophobia for a long time. And as you know, the general policy recommendation number five um, is it, extremely important. And I would I, I challenge you all to go and have a look at it because it advocates for the adoption of a number of specific measures for combating intolerance and discrimination directed against Muslims, but also express regret that Islam is sometimes portrayed or in most cases portrayed inaccurately on the basis of hostile stereotyping. The effect of which is to make this religion seem like a threat everywhere. Um, it is therefore necessary not only to adopt legislation and policies in indicating specific measures prior to that, it is necessary also to raise awareness of the pervasive prejudice and discrimination that Muslims and those who are perceived as such face in everyday life in Europe. I do endeavor to promote the recognition of Action Day as an official European day um, against uh, Islamophobia and support of both the Council of Europe and the European Union is needed on, to this end. And the Action Day is increasingly celebrated by actors including um, RD and ENA and many other organizations. So we need to make sure we acknowledge this day uh, formally um, by our institutions. We have also seen the conflation of Islam with terrorism triggering the rise of Islamophobia in Europe. Um, and members of Muslim communities are at a greater risk today than ever because of uh, this anti-terror 
a legislation that we use in order to be able to infringe on the rights of Muslims. The misconceptions of Muslims as a potentially separate or parallel community at best and a threat to national security at worst often makes the situation of human rights defenders standing up to denounce Islamophobia particularly challenging. The work that you do in FEMISO is extremely important, but because of some of the, the laws that are being enacted in Europe, it makes your work extremely challenging. Individuals and civil society organizations face stigmatization and hostility. The anti-separatism bill that you, you know about in France, bill currently under discussion in French parliament, is an example of this uh, attitude. The bill includes provisions allowing for this dissolution of associations that hold non-mixed activities, such as creating a safe space for environments, a safe space environment for members of racialized groups only. This is it's just ridiculous because people of color, Muslims, and, and people that are you know, belonging to minorities and vulnerable groups, they need these safe spaces. And to, to enact laws and legislation that would somehow infringe in the possibility of creating these safe spaces is nothing but um, a, a way of um, manifesting racism. It is, it is that, that, that is exactly racism, nothing else. It is Islamophobic and it is racist because we need to be able to have safe spaces in order to be able to discuss issues without having uh, to, to worry about what the next person is gonna say, or the next person is gonna feel bad about what I say, or my security, uh, that, that is something that is fundamental, it's, it's basic and we need that. So any legislation that is meant to somehow eradicate or destroy or uh, take away the possibility for us to be able to meet um, separately and discuss our issues is deeply problematic. So government have a duty to uphold the freedom of religion and guarantee that the followers of all faiths and none may live and thrive in their societies without fear of intolerance and discrimination. So this is work that we're doing. And finally, um, there are certain things that ICRI and, and the Council of Europe are working on. And some of the key messages are, as governments, uh, we must protect members of Muslim communities from intolerance and discrimination. And we do that by assessing the scale of intolerance and discrimination directed by, specifically at Muslims, and we need to do that by collecting data to know exactly disaggregated data, how Muslims are affected, how Muslim women are affected, look at it from an intersectional perspective. We need to also ensure that the right to practice their religion is enabled in all areas of public life. It's extremely important we, we do that as legislators. We need to, uh, thirdly, we need to combat hostile stereotyping that paints all Muslims as extremists, both within the media, within the education system, and within the society narrative. We need to work on making sure that we um, um, we combat these issues. Um, finally, better knowledge of an issue is always a precondition for more effective action to address it. In the case of Islamophobia, it is necessary both to learn more about this form of intolerance and to counter the hostile narratives it spreads about Muslims. Because the, the misleading idea that Muslims are a separate community unwilling to be part of a society that at large bears a striking resemblance to traditional anti-Semitic stereotypes and we stereotypes and we know what I have worked, how tragic that is. So denouncing misconceptions and debunking myths is instrumental in promoting solidarity towards and between target groups. This applies to civil society organizations and politicians as well, who should be proactive in denouncing discrimination and ready to react in the face of Islamophobic discrimination. So I call on all legislators and so that Muslims communities are not discriminated against as the as to the circumstances in which they organize and practice their religion. We must impose in accordance with the national context appropriate sanctions in cases of discrimination on grounds of religion. And we not, must take the necessary measures to ensure that freedom of religion is fully guaranteed. In this context, particular attention should be directed towards removing unnecessary legal or administrative obstacles to both the construction of sufficient numbers of appropriate places of worship, but also to make sure that especially women will be able to live freely and they will be included when we talk about gender equity. We, we have what we call the Istanbul Convention, which is uh, uh, one of the world's most comprehensive tool of protecting women. That is not only for white women, it is not only for non-Muslim women, it is for all women. And we need to make sure we look at the intersectional perspective. And it is time to go from words to action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malcolm, for those really, really 
strong and uh, very succinct words outlining the difficult position that uh, Muslims find themselves in. I believe in particular your, your point regarding the intersection between racial-based discrimination and gender-based discrimination, exactly why we're doing an event like this. It's very important that the policies that are enacted, especially ones that are framed around equality, create equal societies for everyone and not just those of the majority. So thank you for being outspoken in that. Uh, I'd also like to make the point that you mentioned specifically around Council of Europe states that are actively engaging around discussions of equality but aren't able to provide equality to their own citizens. This is something that we are always actively trying to speak out against. One, I believe, once again, we are very lucky, as Julie mentioned in the chat box to everyone, to have the representatives and individuals that are there fighting for Muslim communities and, from, and in general minorities in Europe, ensuring that, once again, the, the region that we live in is one that is equal, one that creates societies that are people who support one another, and that the racism and discrimination that individuals face as a result of their race or faith is something that we can eradicate and we hope to eradicate. Thank you so much, uh, Malcolm, for those incredible words. Um, <clears throat> I will now move on to another um, policymaker. Um, I will be moving on to Cornelia Ernst, MEP, um, who is the co-president of the Anti-Racism Diversity Intergroup in the European Parliament, who are kindly also supporting this event. We are very lucky to have worked with the uh, RD group, as they are known, um, for a number of years. And we are very lucky to have um, Cornelia here with us on this incredibly important topic on this incredibly important day. Cornelia, just to check, you can hear us? I think so. Uh, no. I hope you can hear me. It's hey, okay. Loud, loud and clear. Perfect. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm very glad to, uh, to co-host this discussion on behalf of um, RD. Um, it's the first time for me. <laughs> we are your partner and uh, we are honored to make uh, to mark the European Day of uh, Action Against Islamophobia starting with this uh, great event. And uh, this is a tradition that we must continue. The European Parliament acknowledged for the first time the 21st September uh, European Day of Action Against Islamophobia and Religious Intolerance in September 2019. And our now ex-colleague Majid Majid uh, leads this fight uh, together with our great partners from the Open Society, European Policy Institute. And that event marks the beginning of uh, something important. And it's our wish, and I think uh, I speak uh, as a map, it's our responsibility to keep working with you to support this joint cause. To tackle Islamophobia needs an important precondition, and we should speak about this precondition. Re recognize its existence and the dangerous consequences. The reality, if we look in the member states, is that Islamophobia is still not being recorded as a separate cat category of crime in any EU member state. And there is no strategy, definitely no strategy. Islamophobia is normalized by many of those in power. It's a common place for parties during election seasons to associate um, Europeans, Europe's uh, problem only with immigration and the presence of Muslims um, in uh, Europe. Uh, during the last decade, we have seen an increasing in these far-right movements who joined forces to build up to build a sort of a cross-continental alliance against Muslims. Muslims are often equated with terrorists, and uh, at the same time, they are accused of contempt for women. There are great obstacles to overcoming prejudices, misunderstandings, and we need to work on elimination of political messaging that feed hatred toward uh, Muslim communities that needs efforts on both sides. And my, my point is that we not work without the Muslim populations themselves. You cannot develop successful strategies in Europe without involving uh, those affected from the start. And therefore we need a new way of thinking about and a new way of cooperation and understanding with 
uh, Muslim uh, communities. It's important to make it clear that Muslims are an integral part of our European community and welcome. The prejudices of the majority society and last but not least concerns in dealing with one, one another can only be reduced if one deals with one another. And it's a basis for every success, no matter, uh, no matter uh, how small in the fight against Islamophobia, that institution and the European leader recognize the existence of these problems and start building a proper strategy in order to put an end to the different forms of Islamophobia and to assure security to the Muslim community. And let me be very open. We speak about discrimination, 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 but we don't speak about Muslims. This is this is a problem. We don't speak about uh, Islamophobia. We, we don't do it. We speak very general about all, but not about that. What we have to do. I think it's there is a big deficit in the education system. Our education system do not provide knowledge of Islam. This could help to limit confrontation between students and to promote diversity. And I think religious studies have to be diverse, not just reduced to specific religions like the Christian uh, church uh, and religion uh, or others. And uh, general uh, Islamophobia can manifest itself ranging from the structural where institutions actively implement policies which directly exclude Muslim women from public life to the physical where countless examples show the intersectionality between violence against women and faith-based racism. And at the same time, equal recognition of religion does not mean ignoring deficits in the implementation of equality and equality between women and men. There is a lot room for work on all sides, on the side of the um, majority uh, uh, community and the side um, of uh, uh, Muslim community and other communities. Muslim and non-Muslims need one thing else, and this is for me very important, communication, open channels for understanding, open the head and especially the heart. The EU can do a lot um, because uh, within our member states, there are millions of Muslims, um, as well as Christians, Jews, Buddhists. And it's important to understand that the life brings us together, that we all have the same problems in the it, in the last point, and fear uh, and the same hopes and hopes. And uh, yes, I would like to speak about hopes. Hopes are what count. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, um, Cornelia, for those really, really strong words. Once again, I think your point specifically on how discrimination is spoken about, but when it comes to Muslims, often it becomes silent. And I think in particular your point around education and how we must move away from the belief that education solely should be seen as a passive form of engaging with young people, but must be seen as an active method to ensure anti-racism uh, and actually anti-misogynist methods of, uh, of, 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 of societal education are, are prioritised. And, and, and ensuring this is something that we as feminists have always been very clear on and we look forward to working with you and Adi and actually, as the, as the discussion continues, because kindly you are joining us for the question and answer debate session um, as well. But it's once again very, very happy to have you here. And thank you so much for your really, really strong intervention. Um, I will now move on to uh, Dr. Sanya Bilic, who is the Operations and Policy Manager at the European Forum of Muslim Women. I'm very lucky to have uh, Dr. Sanya on with us here today, um, especially because EFOM, as they are known, is an organization that we are very happy to have worked with who are also celebrating, if I believe, the 15th anniversary. Um, so congratulations and, and, and actually uh, well done for reaching this milestone, Sanya, and to the, uh, to the board itself. And I ask you to begin your remarks, if that's OK. Thank you, Yusuf, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really heartened to hear the statements from Commissioner Dali, from Randa, from Malcolm, from Cornelia, MEPs. Um, 
really positive messages there and really something that we are looking forward to collaborate with all of them on. I think um, it's really good to uh, hear that they have recognized the great need to address in particular gender Islamophobia, uh, which is a great, great problem. Um, Islamophobia in itself, and particularly gendered Islamophobia, as we've uh, seen majority of data and research is point pointing towards women as a main, uh, but, you know, bearing the brunt of Islamophobia. Um, so um, I am, as you introduced me, operations and policy manager for European Forum of Muslim Women. We are the largest network of uh, Muslim women organizations across Europe. We have about 20 organizations that we work and collaborate with. Now, um, what I can say is just my experience of working with these women uh, over the past two years or so, um, and it's just, just to have a bit more positivity to this uh, whole story of women, they are ever inspiring. I'm a Muslim myself, but really the, the most motivating, inspiring moments is when we have meetings together. I walk away always full of hope, full of uh, positive energy that in spite of ever increasing challenges that these women face, they're still um, standing, they're still active participants in their society, they are doing everything they can to, to, uh, to, to be the best they can in whichever um, aspects of their lives. And this is something that I think it's not talked about much. So it's important to, <laughs> to realize everydayness of Muslim women. And I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something that I learned from our members briefly before I go on a bit more kind of harsh realities. Uh, I suppose that is harsh in itself, but typical woman that we talk about typical Muslim women, one of million of Muslim, women's, uh, uh, Muslim women in, in Europe, um, is going every day about her business with family, work, leisure, society, whatever challenges every human being faces every day. But her journey has never been easy. From, from you know, the moment go, um, from early school years till till adulthood, she's faced with many difficulties, which which most of the time she learned to negotiate somehow. She, in spite of that, in whichever capacity, she has achieved and accomplished so much. However, Muslim women are increasingly tired, tired of being constantly judged, constantly stereotyped, constantly looked at, harassed, discriminated against, and, and stripped of their basic human rights. Her education, and I'm saying her because I want you to imagine, I want everyone to imagine her as a person. We talk about groups, we talk about communities, but we talk, when we talk about a particular person, we're able to really understand the feelings and everydayness of the struggle. Her education, work, family life, social life, leisure time, everything has been limited, everything has been questioned. It seems whatever Muslim woman does is never really good enough. Is If she chooses to live quietly, focusing on family life, she's considered to be oppressed. Uh, her opinions, identity, if voiced and visible, uh, are always questions. Is, is the, are they their own? Um, if she challenges numerous oppressions she faces in the life, she becomes a problem. She is societal, so, 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 so society suspect by default. That's the position, everyday position. So um, we have this kind of uh, situation when we have Muslim men in terms of Islamophobia, described as often as violent as oppressed. And we have then Muslim women who need to be liberated. This is not a new thing. This is, this is happening for, that has been happening for centuries. 
And I think since two decades of war on terror, uh, majority of legislations and policies in Europe that uh, have been Islamophobic, uh, Muslim women have felt that as a first and foremost kind of line of, of um, uh, how can I say, stigmatization. So um, what does it mean? I often wonder, and I think lots of the women we talk to, our members wonder, what does this mean to be liberated? What does this mean? Who defines this liberation? Um, uh, should Muslim women themselves define the liberation or some politician who is um, having a certain agenda? And we see in Europe increasingly that's leaning towards right. So who defines this liberation? And that moves on to, to, to kind of what about the positive affirmations or, or about freedom of, of expression and one's identity? Why are not Muslim women able to, to exercise that right? Um, so legislation that are pa passed in many European countries, uh, they remove Muslim women's right, as we heard from previous speakers, a basic right to choose what they want to wear. And that in turn affects how Muslim women um, are seen by the rest of society. They everyday ability to, to study, to work, etc. So what, um, what do they do? They contribute the legislation, I mean, this legislation which focus particularly on Muslim women and are usually um, um, interpreted as liberation, as freedom, as neutrality. You can put in the word you like. But what they actually do for Muslim women is create uh, hostility, stereotypes, uh, and basically, because. Uh, as a the really treatment of them as different from the rest of the society. So the new governments driving these um, legislation and policies are actually institutionalizing gender as Islamophobia. And this is the problem. This is what I would like us to really pay attention to and work with MEPs, work with commissioner to challenge this because these Policies and legislations have real effects and multiple layers and layers of effects on Muslim women's lives and participation in European society. So I think that's, that would be all I would uh, like to say, but um, I would um, just emphasize the importance of working together now. Um, it's a huge step to recognize the dire state of affairs as, as far as the gender Islamophobia is in Europe. But now we need to work together to challenge and ch change this. Uh, and like I said, I look forward to, to collaborating with MEPs and with Commission on this. Thank you very much. And I really hope that in the near future, we will not uh, need to have uh, Islamophobia days. Thank you. As always, Sanya, um, it's a real pleasure to host you, and we really appreciate those words that you've, of course, just said. I think the specific part regarding the, the journey of a Muslim woman from, from youth to, to adolescence to adulthood and how their life is defined for them, narratives are created about them, and, and, and unfortunately the, their role is often dispelling these narratives regardless and, and agency being taken away from them. And I'm, very proud as, a, as, as, of course, a board member of FEMISO to, to work with EFOB in being able to dispel these narratives and to ensure that Muslim women are able to reclaim the space themselves and, and of course, speak on their own lives and not have their lives defined for them. And, and as always, we're, we're very thankful to have you as a partner and to have you as, a, as an organization that we work with very closely. Thank you, as always, Sanya. Um, I would now like to introduce <coughs> Julie Pasco uh, from um, the European Network Against Racism another organization that we're very lucky to work with and to have worked with for a very long time. 
Um, Julie is, uh, of course, a very incredibly important uh, activist when it comes to Islamophobia, one of the first and, and one of the few that's constantly working on ensuring that the discussion is had within European institutions, within European civil society. And as always, uh, we are very, very lucky to be, uh, to host, to be hosting Julie. Uh, and I would like to ask her, of course, to, to begin her remarks. Thank you, as always. Thank you. Good morning. Salam alaikum. I hope you can hear me well. That's always the question that's starting all intervention at the moment. Loud and clear. OK, great. So uh, thank you for having me. I must say it's really an honor to be in this panel. Um, I've been really amazed uh, listening to the different speakers. And uh, I think a lot have been said already. And I really want to say that we can really feel that there is a change in narrative and. Uh, an increase in the understanding and recognition of Islamophobia as a form of racism. And this, this panel is really uh, one of the, the best uh, testaments. Um, so I'm from INA, the European Network Against Racism. We are a, a network of more than 180 organizations working on anti-racism, representing very different groups uh, in Europe to advocate for racial equality and justice, especially uh, in the EU um, institution and policies and legislation. So we really ensure that indeed uh, the issue of Islamophobia and, and structural racism is uh, taken into account uh, in, the, in the different developments. So I just would like, I mean, as I said, a lot have been said already. Um, uh, it's true that INA has been working on Islamophobia for, for a long time. Uh, one of our projects also on gender Islamophobia has been mentioned. Um, and I would just like to uh, maybe focus on what are, could be the, the, the key actions, uh, considering all the opportunities we have at EU level now, uh, and what could be uh, yeah, the actions and, and the challenges. Um, so first, when it comes to um, the new anti-racism framework that uh, Commissioner Elena Dali has mentioned, the EU action plan against racism. Yeah, uh, on, the, on the 18th, it was the uh, one year anniversary of this, of this action plan, which is really a landmark document, which again um, is the first time where we have a recognition of structural racism, uh, including uh, anti-Muslim hatred uh, or Islamophobia. And there, uh, I think what is very important to note is again what Commissioner uh, Daly said about the fact that the, the, the action plan includes measures against Islamophobia. It, it recognize uh, Muslims or those perceived as such as victims of racism. And this is really key because we know how sometimes difficult it is to have this, this recognition at, in some countries. Um, what is very important with this EU action plan is that it's also, at least in, in the, in the uh, in the understanding and, and description of, of racism is going beyond individual acts of racism. It recognized that racial prejudices against minorities can feed into policies uh, and, and practices of, of structures in power. And this is really key, especially for the, for, for the form of racism, uh, Islamophobia, because we know, and it has been already discussed, how some, um, some manifestations are very structural, like the prohibition of religious signs at work. We have laws, we have regulations uh, that, that are prohibiting these religious signs. And we know, even though the, the, the language is neutral, we know how in practice it's, it's mainly uh, uh, targeting Muslim women, also because we know how, how these laws are implemented and are, how they are adopted in, in the middle of very uh, Islamophobic debates. So this is very key, and that's uh, actually why uh, we really need to ensure we, we work with this new framework. Um, because there is also, um, at the same time, there are also gaps in this framework. And that's where we need, why, that's also why we need to engage to ensure that the implementation is at the level of the understanding that is in this uh, very, very unique tool. For example, we know how Islamophobia is being developed in the counter-terrorism and counter-radicalization field. All the narrative framing Muslims as potentially dangerous in Europe are actually uh, reinforced and exacerbated in this kind of policies, including in the migration policies, actually. Um, and so far, the, these different policies are not, are not really tackled in the action plan. 
And when we talk about intersectionality, when we talk about racial equality, mainstreaming, that is also mentioned in the action plan, we need to ensure that it's impacting all different policies, that policies are being reviewed to ensure that they don't contribute to racism. And this is really key in this, uh, in this uh, action plan. Because for example, we have, uh, there has been recently new uh, cases in front of the Court of Justice of the European Union, again, um, allowing employers to forbid women to wear the headscarf at work. So this is really legislation at EU level. This is the Court of Justice of the EU level. And there we see that there is still very uh, problematic uh, decisions and problematic implementation of legislation. So how can we talk about fighting against um, Islamophobia, being intersectional, when we still have this kind of decisions that are actually contributing to structural racism. So I just wanted to highlight that as much as it's a very important tool that we need to use to advocate, we also need to, yeah, to engage in these different um, issues because there are still uh, some gaps and challenges. The second point I want to mention is the importance of participation and coalition building. And this is also, I think, the, the, an opportunity that is created by this EU action plan. Uh, and this, let's remember also that this EU action plan has been possible because of the mass mobilization after the murder of George Floyd. This is one of the direct results. We wouldn't have had, uh, at least not that rapidly, a new action plan if there would have, wouldn't have been this massive mobilization. So their participation and coalition building is key to ensure the implementation, is key that this plan doesn't remain on paper. And this, this was mentioned already, the importance to keep racialized groups and Muslims at the center of decision making, at the center of consultation and meaningful participation. The EU action plan is creating, is creating this kind of opportunities. Um, as mentioned by the commissioner, there is a, a subgroup on national action plan against racism, where actually a civil society can engage with their national representatives to ensure that their issues are reflected in the national action plan against racism. Which, which actually this action plan at national level should be adopted in all member states by 2022. So I really think that it's, it's key for civil society to, uh, to be actively engaged at national level with their representatives for the, EU, uh, for the national action plan, uh, uh, but also at EU level in this NAPA subgroup. Um, and moreover, there is another also forum where you could engage at EU level is the, uh, the anti-racist forum created by the new uh, coordinator on, uh, on anti-racism. And there again, this is a space for civil society to be engaged and to be able to really fit into the implementation phases. And we, we need to push for that. We need meaningful leadership and consultation. This is a key aspect of fighting against structural racism. Racism is also about power and privilege. If we don't manage to be meaningfully consulted and, and, and we don't manage to get this meaningful participation, then we will not be able to really uh, overcome structural racism. Another point is solidarity building and coalition. This EU action plan is tackling all forms of racism, is looking at the structural roots of racism. And this is really an opportunity for us to build stronger alliances with all forms of racism, with all racialized groups, because sometimes we also have tended to, to look at our form of racism and not looking at what is, you know, the red thread among all these oppressions. And this is key to be able to have, to build a stronger front and stronger alliances in order to really dismantle these structural issues. And finally, I want to finish by a key point that has been also mentioned, which is the change of narrative. Because even though we have good laws, even though we have good policies, if we don't change the narrative that are framing Muslims are already guilty as already uh, dangerous, the implementation of all this legislation and policies will not change because judges, because courts are also humans. They are also influenced by racial, deep-rooted racial pre prejudices. And we see that, for example, in some decisions on, on headscarf bans or, or the way um, the way, again, Muslim women are portrayed as either um, um, dismissive or either um, uh, dangerous, as mentioned uh, by, by the project and all different reports. So 
there is really a need there. And, and what is key in this change of narrative is for policymakers, is for public figures to denounce and be vocal. And we are still missing that. We are really missing that. When the, the collective against Islamophobia in France has been uh, dissolved, we had a lot of trouble to get these public figures to say something. We had a lot of trouble to have them really counter this narrative, again, framing Muslims, framing um, activists fighting against Islamophobia as uh, dangerous and, 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 and potentially like feeding into uh, terrorism. This has been a very negative uh, narrative and there were not a lot of people out there to say that. And that's what we need. Uh, like if we really want to go beyond buzzwords, if we want to have proper implementation, we need this kind of uh, counter narrative. Otherwise, not a lot of things will change. The test will be, I think Islamophobia is one of the tests for the EU action plan against racism. Because if it's not tackled properly, if uh, public figures are not ready to engage on this issue publicly, the, 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 the EU action plan won't, won't really lead to, to results. Because we know how Islamophobia is also, the, the, the anti-Muslim narrative is being used to justify so many abuses against migrants, against many different uh, people, and in the end, like, actually infringing rights of all. And uh, I will finish by that and say that next year, the first semester is the, is the French presidency of the EU. And there also it will be a test for public figures at the EU uh, level. Because we know the situation in France. We know how France is leading, um, I mean, at least the French, the French government and French public, some of them, French, some French public figures are really leading and, and feeding into this, this narrative of Islamophobia. So we, we really hope that the EU will stand uh, by its values and, and, and go against any uh, narrative against Muslims at this moment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julie, uh, for those really, really, once again, well thought out and, and, and tangible points that can be used by those listening to understand the reality of what needs to be done to address gender Islamophobia and to address Islamophobia in general. Um, I'm sure like everyone in this room and everyone online, we thank you for the work that you do and the work that Anna does to be able to platform this and ensure that these discussions are had at the top tables. Uh, as an organization, we have uh, always worked with Anna. Uh, we are one of its members and we recommend if you don't know about Anna, then please do go on their website and see the incredible work that they do on a multitude of different topics. Um, this now brings us into the next part of the session, which will act as a method for us to be able to, of course, hear your thoughts as well, for those of you that are online. Uh, we will now have a, uh, a policy debate session with um, selected um, policymakers, and of course the policymakers that remain with us online currently. Um, this session will be, um, will have a uh, Italian um, section of it where Pier Fresco Maggiorino, the MEP, will speak in Italian. Therefore, we ask at the bottom of your Zoom, you'll be able to switch to English if you go to the interpretation button. Just a reminder for everyone to do that, unless you, of course, you speak Italian and you prefer to hear her directly. Um, during this session, uh, I will call upon the different policymakers and, and individuals, but we will also ask attendees for their thoughts as well. So if you would like to take part, or would like to ask a question, please do use the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom, um, to send in some questions, and I will try my utmost best to go through them. And if you would like to ask a question live, please do raise your hand as an attendee, which is possible by going once again to the bottom of your screen. I hope that is clear. Um, and now I would like to invite um, Pierre Fresco, uh, Francesco to, to provide his Okay, no problem. That's fine. Then I will move on directly to uh, the first question that we had, which is a question that I would like to address, uh, if possible, to Julie and to, um, and to, and to Cornelia, if that's okay. Um, the first question is around the topic of policy perspectives. Um, as mentioned throughout the meeting, after one year, uh, following the Action Plan Against Racism publication, some, port, some portable initiatives have been uh, launched. 
and implemented the founding values of the European Union equality and the reality in which discrimination is impairing the lives of and well-being of vulnerable groups has been prioritized as an area of interest. My question for you, Cornelia, if that's okay, um, immediately is how can the European Parliament facilitate the adoption of the horizontal directive to cover the shortcoming in the protection of Muslims? As you mentioned during your, um, your remarks, there was a specific lacking when it came to specifically Muslim women and Muslims in general. Therefore, it'd be great to hear your perspective on that question. Please do go ahead if you can hear me. I think you're still muted. No, no, you're, no. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Perfectly. Okay. Um, I think it's not uh, easy to speak about that uh, because of, um, uh, if you look in the European Parliament um, and um, the different members, you will see we have strong uh, right-wing parties inside of the Parliament. And um, uh, all what we do is to find a good compromise. Uh, this is more or less the situation. And um, I think what we need are um, a good coalition between the center left groups to uh, come uh, to more or less concrete steps, uh, concrete steps uh, against um, Islamophobia. And if you speak about the directive, um, then I think we need um, good information, uh, maybe by um, hearings about the situation, and uh, that we know directly this is the problem. How uh, uh, can uh, these are our, our, our uh, problems? Uh, this is very, very important. You should know. I think that a lot of uh, people know a lot, um, a lot of uh, members know a lot about uh, discrimination, uh, about Jewish people, uh, about um, uh, Roma and Sinti uh, in Europe, but, but not really because of the many, many uh, prejudices, not, not, not many uh, knowledge uh, is there uh, about the situation, especially of uh, Muslim uh, women. Uh, and um, there are so many uh, uh, stupid ideas in the uh, head of the people. Uh, I see you, Julie, you are a, a wonderful woman. Uh, you, are, you are knowledge, well knowledge and, and all, yes, but you should know uh, that a lot of people uh, uh, in Europe and yes, in this parliament think a lot of stupid things about uh, women like you. And that's why we need knowledge, really knowledge. And then we need a, a concrete um, um, uh, speech, um, concrete tasks uh, what, and measures uh, for the uh, member states. Uh, that means the member states are the key. We, we need bindly measures in the member states. A directive is nice, really super nice, yes, but a directive is not enough. We need bindly uh, uh, measures and uh, we need also a control of these bindly measures that uh, they do uh, uh, um, in the member states enough um, against that. This is really a long, long way I see so. Um, and um, uh, that's why we, we need more communication about that, really more communication. And this is for me the key. So, thank you so much, Cornelia. Julie, can I maybe ask you your thoughts? Yes, thank you very much. And it's true, I agree. I mean, we need to have different kind of um, strategies. I think we, we need communication, we need counter narratives, but we also need legislation, we need soft policies. That's also what we say when we advocate for action plans uh, for, for these kind of policies. We need the combination of different strategies. And on the directive, the horizontal directive uh, specifically, um, I want also to call for vigilance because um, we know uh, this directive has been in the pipeline for many years. Now there is, it seems there is still uh, some hope to get it adopted. But we know like throughout the negotiations uh, with member states, there, ha there have been some countries trying to put inside the text 
um, some uh, opt out, like some some way for countries not to uh, put into question their existing uh, bans on religious signs, especially in education, for example. So if we have a, a, a if we end up with a directive that is actually allowing some member states to continue to discriminate Muslim women in some key areas of life, then this direct this directive won't be at uh, intersection at all and will actually like again this this will be the kind of policy like contributing to uh, again to inequalities and the problem also with this narrative is that it's still uh, um, having an uh, having an angle on individual acts of discrimination and not really looking at the structural level so i mean let's see how we move forward but there is also an idea like shouldn't we be like also like presenting and, 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 and uh, proposing something new. I know we, we know how difficult it is because to get this directive we need unanimity. But let's let's be creative and try also to ensure that this this directive, if adopted, will not create more problems than, than anything, at least for some groups. Okay, thank you so much for that, uh, Julie. Um, I believe uh, Pierre Francesco is with us. Um, Buongiorno, ciao, mi sentite? Mi sentite? Buongiorno, mi sentite? Io sono collegato. Non capisco se mi sentite, però. Non sento più nulla io. Bene, eh, mi sono collegato, eh, in questo momento sono in un quartiere di Milano, il quartiere del Corvetto, che è un quartiere molto complesso, particolare, e non, non ho sentito, sto vedendo dalla chat che mi ascoltate, mi sentite, quindi penso di poter intervenire, non so però se c'è una domanda, quindi vi volevo chiedere, visto che non sento nessuno di voi, ma leggo i messaggi che state scrivendo, mh, volevo semplicemente sapere se c'era una domanda in particolare o se vi porto semplicemente il mio saluto e dico alcune cose anche in ragione dei contenuti dell'incontro di oggi. Um, I think we need to go to, I think he's doing the original audio before we have to change. Okay, give us one minute. Pier Francesco, can you hear us? Non vi dico, okay, eccoti, sì, assolutamente. Buongiorno. Perfetto, buongiorno, buongiorno a tutti, grazie davvero per, questo, per questa opportunità di incontro che mi eh, fornite, che, for che ci fornite, considero davvero rilevante tutto il ragionamento che viene fatto per eh, contrastare qualsiasi forma di eh, discriminazione e per estendere una cultura dei diritti per tutti, per far sì che i sentimenti di intolleranza verso le persone in relazione alla religione, al culto, al, al colore della pelle o al genere o all'orientamento sessuale siano effettivamente sconfitti. Credo quindi che ci debba essere un impegno da parte di tutti molto deciso in questa direzione, le istituzioni sia comunitarie che i diversi stati membri debbano fare la loro parte senza sottovalutare evidentemente il contesto problematico nel quale siamo. Credo però che questa battaglia culturale, civile, che dobbiamo vincere per tutelare tutte le persone, le persone musulmane, ma anche 
eh, non solo evidentemente le persone eh, di religione musulmana, le donne, le ragazze, a prescindere davvero dal culto eh, per tutelarle affinché non siano mai discriminate e perché si contrastino i messaggi d'odio. Ecco, dicevo, penso che questa battaglia noi la possiamo vincere se affrontiamo due grandi aspetti. Da una parte quello evidentemente del sostegno a un messaggio positivo legato alla ricchezza della società multiculturale, eh, multietnica, legata al fatto che la società cambia e si fonda sull'incontro tra persone molto diverse per le loro biografie, le loro storie. Non dobbiamo avere paura di questo, anzi dobbiamo favorire, io credo, a partire proprio dalle scuole, il massimo del valore positivo di questa eh, nuova storia europea e non solo che dobbiamo costruire. Poi c'è un altro tipo di ragionamento che non dobbiamo assolutamente sottovalutare ed è quello legato al fatto che spesso le intolleranze si eh, alimentano anche di una paura legata alle condizioni economiche, sociali. Prima si diceva, sentivo che si diceva, eh, si riferiva della questione della diseguaglianza ed è un problema vero. L'oratrice diceva eh, va combattuta la diseguaglianza, ma dobbiamo combatterla sempre e non dobbiamo sottovalutare il fatto che condizioni di grande marginalità economica e sociale spesso fanno sì che le persone più ostili nei confronti, ad esempio, dei cittadini o delle cittadine eh, di religione musulmana eh, o di origine straniera in diversi parti d'Europa, sono le persone più povere, cioè le persone maggiormente in difficoltà sul piano economico e sociale sono quelle che avvertono eh, non tanto una diffidenza per, rispetto a modi di essere diversi, ma avvertono magari una eh, paura nell'accesso agli strumenti di welfare, cioè dicono arrivano altri che com saranno in competizione con noi sul piano del, eh, del welfare. E quindi abbiamo bisogno, credo, di ricordarci sempre che finché non c'è una maggiore e più radicale politica contro le diseguaglianze sociali, si fonderanno, si terranno insieme i razzisti, gli intolleranti, coloro che odiano, con chi eh, si trova eh, in condizioni di difficoltà e semplicemente, pur non essendo minimamente intollerante, ha paura eh, perché magari c'è una casa popolare in meno o a, a disposizione o c'è più difficoltà a trovare lavoro. Infine concludo, c'è un altro enorme tema che è quello di affrontare la questione della condizione delle ragazze e delle donne in alcune comunità, dentro alcune comunità. Anche questo alimenta, io credo, l'intolleranza, ma soprattutto alimenta la fragilità di ragazze e donne che rischiano di essere eh, colpite due volte. Da una parte guardate in maniera diffidente da parte di tanti cittadini nella società e dall'altra essere eh, non sufficientemente libere all'interno dei propri contesti e questo è un altro aspetto che dobbiamo assolutamente valorizzare in questo io credo che le istituzioni comunitarie debbano fare un grande grande lavoro ed è indispensabile l'apporto di storie di organizzazioni come eh, chi, diciamo come la vostra e come quelle che qui in qualche modo sono, si incontrano oggi. Vi ringrazio. Thank you, uh, Pier Francesco, for those really, really important remarks on the framework you're referring to, of course, is the framework that we are advocating for as Project Meet, which is aimed around, of course, eliminating gender Islamophobia through two means, dispelling narratives and ensuring that Muslim women are able to reclaim those said narratives in the manner in which uh, their lives are projected. Um, I will move on to the second question that I have. This one directly at Julie, first, if that's okay. Um, and that question is framed around what kind of synergies should be activated among CSOs and policymakers to cover the gaps that law enforcement and law provisions 
in effective and a, and a concrete manner. It'd be great to hear your thoughts, Julie. Um, yeah, so this is really related to, to, I think, to the point I was mentioning about coalition building. Um, as I mentioned also, even though we have uh, laws, even though we have policies, we know how racial prejudices are still um, influencing the implementation and, and leading to huge gaps in the implementation. So that's why um, it's really crucial to, uh, to build coalitions. And not only uh, inside the communities, but you know, beyond as well with other groups that also have, um, have to, to, to deal with the, this uh, form of racism. Um, especially at grassroots level, I think we could, uh, uh, when you work at grassroots level, you cannot really easily access funding or you, you, do, you have trouble maybe to get in touch with your, um, of the, the authorities. Uh, I think you have a lot to learn from existing grassroots initiatives that may be in other kinds of communities. And I would really encourage you to reach out to other, kind, to other minorities because sometimes they also have uh, more expertise or different expertise that can really uh, help you, especially when something is happening, you can also easily then build alliances uh, in order to uh, protest, in order to, um, to, to advocate, then you have a stronger front because it's true, especially on Islamophobia, the organizations at grassroots level, but also at national level are easily vulnerable because they are so easily demonized and their, their rights are so easily infringed because of that, because they are guilty by, before everything. So really I encourage you to do that um, and share expertise with, with, with these organizations. Also, this could also help you access some fundings because sometimes when you build coalition, you can also have more resources to access, uh, to access funding. And um, you can also be more intersectional because that's also where the power lies. It, we are not just Muslims. As we mentioned, we are also Muslim women. We are also black. Uh, so, I mean, Muslim communities is so diverse. There are also Roma. So uh, we really need to pay attention to, to, that, to this as well. There are people who that maybe don't self identify primarily as Muslims or, you know, so we really need, this, I think this is really a duty to reach out. And this is how we will build our power as well. And this is what Black Lives Matter movement has showed as well, and because it became very intersectional at some point. So this is what I can say on, on that. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, Cornelia, I think it'd be great to hear your perspective on the, the synergies, the way that civil society and policymakers can work together as well. For us, this is essential uh, to have a very strong contacts with the civil uh, organizations. But uh, if we speak about law enforcement, we should be very open and speak about uh, the reality. First of all, we have to uh, to should list it uh, and recognize there there is uh, a crime, uh, Islamophobia. Uh, and um, if we uh, don't speak about this crime and uh, we don't have a structure to include it in the law enforcement, then it's a senseless. And um, for me, is it uh, not, not, not so easy if we speak about law enforcement. Uh, that needs uh, much time. And um, that's why I think we need a form of organization, a kind of organization like a round table uh, cooperation in the member states uh, to discuss it and to look uh, what, what is the right way. You can also destroy a lot of things uh, if you speak about law enforcement, law enforcement, law enforcement. Um, and um, it, 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 uh, it's possible to, to uh, destroy a lot <laughs> if you only speak about that. And uh, th that needs a lot of concrete knowledge. And I think a lot of lawmakers don't know uh, what, what, is a, what is a real problem for Muslims uh, uh, if we speak about um, uh, crime and uh, if we uh, demand uh, law and more law and about other law enforcement with, with more uh, effects uh, for uh, these uh, uh, people. And um, yeah, that's why my most important point is uh, we need a structured dialogue 
uh, not tired of blah blah blah. Uh, I mean, a round table with uh, with uh, concrete uh, measures, with um, uh, points, what we have to include uh, in the member states in the in the law um, developments. Uh, then we can uh, be successful. Otherwise, we should look um, only to speak about law enforcement. Is, maybe this can also a big problem more for Muslims um, um, if I look uh, in a lot of countries like Hungary or, uh, or others uh, where we have a lot of other problems, not only these problems. Yeah, more or less that. Thank you so much, Cornelia. Um, once again, a very frank, um, as we would say, uh, and clear. <laughs> Uh, perspective on the challenges facing civil society organizations and, and how there is justified um, concern when it comes to engaging with lawmakers. So I think you're completely right. I think it, I'm sure uh, this is an area of focus that our partners are working on in particular, but it'd be great to, uh, of course, work with you on that as well to ensure that we're able to communicate that using the effective uh, institutional uh, instruments that, of course, exist. Moving on to the second topic. Uh, which is around gender Islamophobia, prejudices and intersectionalities with regards to that. Um, I would like to, of course, welcome the audience. If you have any questions, please do send them in using the Q&A box. And if any of our panelists have any points in particular, it'd be very interesting to hear your perspectives uh, as well, for those of you that remain with us, especially because many of you are experts uh, in this area of, of uh, anti-racism. Moving on. Um, I would like to bring in um, Julie again, if that's okay. Um, when it comes to the specific forms of uh, racism that we're referring to now, gender Islamophobia, there needs to be a balance. There needs to be public and private stakeholders engaging, um, and they need to be more involved in, 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 in how uh, we tackle this issue. How do you believe they can be more involved? Um. So for private stakeholders, for example, at, at INA, we have an equal at work platform, which is a, a platform gathering private companies. And we try to link them with CSOs and trade unions, equality bodies, etc. And there uh, we really see the, 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 the power of, of, of these companies to, to really push for, for societal change. And also in the narrative, because I mean, work, we always say that's where we, we spend most of our time. So um, what I think what, what this kind of private companies could do is to actually be more be progressive on this issue. And I'm talking, of course, specifically about one of, one of the key issues in, in the employment when it comes to Muslim women is the, the prohibition of religious science and especially how legislation at EU level is allowing uh, for employers to prohibit uh, these science. And what we do is we encourage private companies to go beyond and be progressive and have in mind that they have this power for societal change. And I think after Black Lives Matter again, there has been also a kind of um, understanding and maybe uh, taking into more uh, into account the importance of of be of be this actor of change, even though sometimes it's a bit uh, whitewashed, but. Um, it's, it's also, we also see a positive uh, uh, step towards that. And what would be good, for example, is to have more private companies doing public communication around having a diversity of workforce, including a Muslim woman, including a Muslim man, et cetera, to really debunk uh, this, this, um, this, this negative narrative. I think we, we really like, we really need to use their power when it comes to communication and marketing <laughs> to, to do that. Uh, this is one, one, one very important aspect. When it comes to the public, it's the same. Uh, I'm, again, I'm really thinking about employment again. Um, we, it's very powerful, for example, when, when the former president of the commission said he had no problem to hire a Muslim woman wearing a headscarf. Uh, this is, can be really symbolic, but we, we need this kind of step forward. Even though we know nothing, is, it's not perfect, etc. but we need this kind of elements of narrative. And we need this strong, um, this strong step forward, also by public figures and public institutions, 
And when we understand diversity, we also understand that Muslim women are also uh, part of the di a diverse workforce um, and, and publicly so. Okay, thank you so much, Julie, for that. Um, I would like now to move on to Pierre Francesco. I hope he can hear us clearly. Um, Sì, molto rapidamente, è chiaro che il discorso è molto complesso in ragione del fatto che poi i contesti in Europa tra di loro su questo tema sono effettivamente diversi, però tentando di fare una, una riflessione, di portare una, avanti una riflessione che possa accomunare tutti, io credo credo che dobbiamo essere molto duri sul terreno dell'efficacia dell'azione repressiva nei confronti di chi eh, porta avanti comportamenti eh, chiaramente violenti, intolleranti rispetto al mondo musulmano e islamico e quindi contrastare con molta durezza e molta nettezza, questo è stato detto e sono ovviamente d'accordo. Dobbiamo anche però penso lavorare in termini preventivi rispetto a un discorso positivo sulla capacità di tenere insieme storie tra loro diverse e fare politiche pubbliche che evitino la ghettizzazione del mondo musulmano islamico. Su questo forse sono influenzato dal punto di vista della realtà diciamo, italiana, laddove non si sono fatte politiche pubbliche, io credo, sufficientemente coraggiose per, ad esempio, garantire il diritto di culto. Ciò ha portato ha la ghettizzazione e quindi radicalizza la chiusura nelle comunità e offre un volto spesso assolutamente sbagliato e, e alimenta eh, l'intolleranza o perfino la paura rispetto a cosa possa essere il fantomatico mondo musulmano, islamico eh, e dunque non una ovvia, come per tutti noi, presenti qui, eh, diciamo, eh, storia di storie diverse, un ovvio incontrarsi tra persone differenti eh, che hanno eh, tra l'altro anche spesso alle spalle tradizioni molto diverse. Eh, e si, quindi l'emarginazione che crea la ghettizzazione che alimenta la paura, questo è un punto io penso essenziale delle politiche pubbliche su cui si deve lavorare con molto più eh, coraggio e decisione. Torno a dire che ritengo che la scuola sia il primo e non eh, uno dei tanti, ma il primo strumento più importante. Infine, chiudo, eh, dobbiamo essere molto efficaci rispetto all'utilizzo della rete per alimentare l'islamofobia, come per alimentare la cultura dell'intolleranza verso eh, qualsiasi, diciamo, eh, parte della società che non viene considerata come quella eh, più tradizionale e da tutelare. E, e in rete ci sono evidentemente attori che fanno di tutto per alimentare la tensione e per organizzare un messaggio molto duro e molto negativo. Su questo terreno la Commissione europea, incalzata dal Parlamento, sta facendo cose importanti, finalmente affrontando il tema del rapporto, ad esempio, con, la, con le piattaforme, la loro responsabilizzazione maggiore eh, e dobbiamo insistere proprio perché la rete, che è uno straordinario strumento ovvio per tenerci insieme, è anche magari positivo per far emergere un lato molto significativo delle storie positive della comunità islamica e musulmana eh, è anche però la rete un giacimento di comportamenti mo molto negativi eh, e davvero intolleranti e violenti e dobbiamo quindi presidiare al massimo il, eh, questo campo per essere molto netti e molto duri. Eh, credo che anche il mondo musulmano islamico debba fare a volte un maggiore eh, lavoro di apertura ehm, o meglio debba essere eh, debba non se sottovalutare forse è più corretto dirla così non debba sottovalutare il fatto che la paura e l'intolleranza che c'è eh, rischia di essere alimentata pure da una, una sensazione di chiusura della comunità che poi per chiunque la conosca le storie delle persone musulmane tutti noi sappiamo che sono tutti luoghi comuni sbagliati però io penso che non vadano sottovalutate confido molto in una nuova generazione di ragazze e ragazzi della comunità islamica 
che lavorino al massimo per aprire e costruire il massimo di relazioni, ponti e per essere in questo modo anche un veicolo per incalzare tutte le istituzioni a non sottovalutare l'odio e l'intolleranza. Thank you so much, uh, Pier, Pier Francesco, uh, for those really, really excellent remarks focused on how young people must be seen as an important stakeholder in engaging and how the work of the Commission and the different instruments of the European institutions can be used in order to tackle this specific area. I'd like to bring in Cornelia, if that's okay, just to ask her thoughts as well on the role of public and private stakeholders um, with regards to fighting gender Islamophobia in particular and how can they you know of course contribute towards the change that we want to see as you mentioned uh, I can start uh, with my first words uh, um, in my introduction I think we we, we have uh, to, to to look in our education so sorry in the schools if you look uh, in uh, in the schools uh, there you will see um, we only speak about one religion, maybe. If we have uh, a good day, then about two religions. The Christians and the, the Jewish uh, uh, people, more or less, we speak about that. But uh, outside, um, uh, inside of the uh, schools, uh, there don't exist Muslims. And uh, this, is, this is wrong. What we need is a public uh, a change in the view of the world. Um, that um, uh, Muslims are part uh, of our society in the schools, in the universities. This is very, very important uh, in, in this education, key uh, education uh, that we have uh, changes there. Authorities, we have to speak about mayors in the cities, in the regions. Uh, they need support to understand uh, what are our neighbors. Um, and uh, then it would be helpful uh, to support uh, by uh, the public uh, NGOs, NGOs working in this field, have a lot of, a lot of knowledge. And, um, but I also think um, that a private uh, person is also very important to have and to show uh, positive examples of what is possible in the neighborhood. And um, uh, this is for me the point we need um, a, a structured, uh, um, um, a structured dealing about uh, when we speak about that, and not only uh, step by step. Look, uh, yeah, today this, tomorrow another thing. Um, we need um, an infrastructure um, in our society. Uh, then uh, we can go step by step forward. Thank you so much, Cornelia, um, for that really, really important intervention. Um, and I completely agree with you. There are so many different stakeholders, as you've mentioned, that need to be engaged with in order for us to be able to effectively ensure that the narratives that are you know, projected onto Muslim women and Muslims in general are dealt with. And education is an incredible way to start. It's very useful. You mentioned the word intelligence, uh, education and youth because, of course, the next part of the session, the concluding part for the next couple of minutes, will be framed around youth and youth engagement in this topic. Um, I'm very lucky to be joined for this part of the debate uh, by Zamzal Ibrahim. Zamzal Ibrahim is the Vice President of the European Students' Union, um, formerly the President of the National Union of Students in the UK, um, and someone that we have been very lucky to work with for a number of years, uh, particularly focused on young people's engagement with policy making and young people's engagement with the way that society be, should be recreated. Now, a question that we often speak about, because I'm thankful to be personal friends with Zamzam, maybe she doesn't consider me as such, but let's assume, um, is when it comes to youth policy, there, is a, there seems to be an a understanding which is framed that youth are seen as a specific group of people and we engage policy around them solely for them as a group itself versus understanding that young people fundamentally are the individuals that will benefit and engage with policies that are implemented for the rest of their lives. So, so how, then do you believe we can you know, best ensure that policy 
is created for young people in a manner that is, you know, realistic versus what we're currently experiencing. Um, thank you very much. First of all, um, pleasure to be here um, at this very, very important event. Um, and the work that Project was doing is incredibly fundamental and key. Um, I have been involved in tackling gender Islamophobia. Raise my voice. Assalamu alaikum and hello. Um, I'm Susan Ibrahim um, and I've got a lovely introduction from Yusuf. Um, so I have been involved in, for a number of years actually on gender Islamophobia um, on campuses specifically um, across the UK um, and now have been working as a vice president of the European Students Union um, which fundamentally focuses on education um, that was just mentioned by uh, one of the previous, previous speakers. Um, and so Actually, the work that project is doing is incredibly important, incredible, incredibly key, um, and it's something um, that I would like to see massively, massively invested in and, 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 and resourced to be able to tackle on an actual and, 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 and a real platform. Um, to pivot back to the question um, that you asked, um, I think he's getting around saying the word tokenization, right? The, the reality is that often when young people are engaged in policy, when young people are, are um, involved in create the creation of policy we're often engaged with in in the form of a tick box exercise and then in the answers of like um i mean we have heard of the concept of like and the european commission are great at doing this because we work with them closely it's quite literally um a committee that reports to a committee that reports to a committee that reports to a committee, that to a committee. <coughs> this is like this is like european lobby 101 now like everybody in this space like more or less knows that right um but the reality is like meaningful engagement in any form right even even taking away youth Meaningful engagement means quite literally having a stake in what comes out of, 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 of that engagement process. And often, all, almost always, when young people are consulted, they are kind of like the tick box exercise to say that we, we engage with the youth or we, we, we spoke to, to a youth group. But the reality is, um, and, and it's in, in, in the words that you used, um, youth engagement isn't important, it's fundamental. And when something's fundamental, um, it needs to, you need to be a part of that process, not just in the in the consultation of it, but in the implementation of it, right? Like you can't make change and 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 and, and as somebody that has been involved in grassroots organizing all the way up to now policy um, lobbying and, and, and policy writing, is that you can't make actual and meaningful change um, if you aren't involved in the full process of it and understand the full process of it. And often almost always, and the reality is in, in, in all policy. It affects young people disproportionately. Like the, the reality is um, we have the most to lose um, and the most to gain in, 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 these, in these processes. So actually, um, when we, when we develop, develop policy, I think for me, the, the, the most important thing is understanding what, youth, what meaningful youth engagement looks like, right? And embodying that in the work that we do and embodying that in the policy writing, embodying that in the implementation of it, embodying it in, in actually reviewing it, because I think Often, almost always, what doesn't happen in 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 in, in, in policy making is is actually taking a step back, right? When you're so fundamentally involved in in the work that's happening and and and, and the formation of it, you kind of lose sight of, of of the the end goal, right? What you're trying to achieve. Um, and so, actually, taking yourself out of it, or even bringing in other other people to kind of like have a a fresh perspective on that to review um, and 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 to continue on that course. Because I, honestly, as I think. One of the um, the things that um, and I'm sure many of you are aware of is that consistently things are changing, right? Um, and as like the political ground that we walk on and we navigate changes, um, our approach and our strategies needs to continue to change and evolve as well. Um, and I think that's really important. I mean, Julie mentioned um, the French presidency um, term coming up, but I think understanding that like when different presidencies are in charge we know the the, the 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 ground that we're working on in terms of like how how we organize completely changes and completely moves and it's understanding how you navigate that it's understanding how you change that and who you need to engage at different stages um and and the reality is uh often almost always we don't have that knowledge and it's knowing and understanding when to step up um, step out and, and bring in individuals that do have that knowledge and and, and engage with and meaningfully engage with them uh, people who are able to shape your policy in in a, in, a, in a way in which you'll have a greater impact, and I guess out of that everybody wins. Indeed, thank you so much for that, Zanza. Really, really incredible answer to my question, um, and I'm sure many of those listening will agree completely with you. Um, we are coming to the end of the session, but I do want to bring in Cornelia, if that's okay, um, if she is still there. 
just to ask her perspective, uh, if she's still there, I'm not sure, I think there she is. Um, your perspective on, on meaningful youth engagement in the policy making process. Can you hear us? Um, not really. Uh, what was the question? Sorry, I didn't the question, hear it. The question was, um, how can we have meaningful youth engagement in the policy making process? Mm. Specifically, of okay. course, when we're speaking about anti-racism. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think um, um, now we are in the pandemic uh, time, but I hope uh, I'm waiting for the end of them. and. Um, for me, it would be, would be helpful to uh, to create um, a platform in the European Parliament, maybe um, a youth platform of um, uh, young uh, Muslim people um, in the European Parliament um, that would be helpful uh, to to uh, look um, in the details, uh, to look um, in uh, the rules uh, in Europe and in the member states and what we can do. Um, um, this, I think, would be a good, um, a positive um, uh, step forward uh, to combine our work with, with your work of uh, young uh, people, um, young Muslims uh, in uh, different uh, organizations or, uh, or in no organizations. We have uh, such an um, uh, um, organization uh, in the asylum uh, area. Uh, we have a um, parliament, more or less a, a platform of uh, asylum seeker in uh, the European Parliament. And for me, it's important that we come to a structured um, cooperation. This is sensible. Uh, all the other things are nice words uh, in a lot of uh, conferences, but not enough. And uh, we need your expertise. And maybe we can uh, organize uh, such a platform. For me, it would be helpful. We can use uh, our um, knowledge as um, Adi. Uh, that means uh, the support of uh, more than one <laughs> uh, and um, more than one um, um, uh, groups uh, of the European Parliament. That means the most of the groups, I think, uh, are able and uh, willing uh, to do that. Thank you so much um, for that intervention, Cornelia, and, and Zamzamov as well, of course. That brings us to an end of the policy debate session. And that begins a break that we will take for the next 15 minutes. And we are very clear um, that the national feeds into the European and an understanding of how Islamophobia, in particular gender Islamophobia, manifests itself in each of these regions is very important to be able to understand the work that we're trying to achieve at the end of the day. Um, to begin, um, I will ask Linda Mayoki is a PhD researcher uh, at Ibn Khaldun University um, and a contributor to the European Islamophobia Report to begin. Um, we're very, very lucky to have Linda here with us uh, online, of course. Um, someone who is very clear and, 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 and is an important actor on the European level regarding the work done to tackle gender Islamophobia. Uh, since June, she has worked at the European Coalition of Cities Against Racism as the coordinator of a working group on anti-Muslim racism. And she's also active in the European Forum on Muslim Women um, as the organization's general secretary. I'd like to pass the floor to Linda. Thank you so much, Yusuf. Um, just checking that you all can hear me. Uh, just clarifying that now. Can you do that one okay. more time? Super, great. Thank so you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be with you today in this uh, very important event. And I have been pleased to listen to the other um, presenters and um, speakers uh, from, from this forenoon. Um, very good comments. Um, I mean, it's clear that we have here people with us who are genuinely interested in making a difference on the European level and, of course, also on national level. Now, um, I only have 10 minutes, as I have been instructed, so I'm trying to give uh, very short notes. <laughs> um, I'm not going to give you any kind of 
you know, summary of my research or anything of the sort. But of course, I mean, anything that I'm saying and anything that I'm arguing today for is based on my research and work in Finland, which is my native country, where I have been conducting um, an empirical study on convert Muslims' uh, experiences on Islamophobia. And women have, of course, been um, a major group of my sample, so to say, um, of the people that I have been involved with in my research. Now, first of all, I would like to note that um, obviously Muslim women in Finland, they are just as affected um, by Islamophobia as Muslim women elsewhere in Europe are. And uh, just to give you a very short uh, statistics about the current state of affairs, or actually this is a state of affairs from, from 2019, we have uh, statistics from, the, um, from hate crime in Finland. Uh, there is a study conducted by the... Uh, um, Police University of Finland um, on a yearly basis, but at the moment we only have the numbers from 2019. So what is basically going on in Finland is that at, at the end of the day, 50% of all the hate crime that is committed against um, or actually with a bias motivation based on religion, 50% uh, of those victims, they are um, Muslims. And among those victims, 60% are women. So indeed, women are most victimized um, on hate crime. Um, Muslim women are most victimized on hate crime in Finland at the moment. And um, obviously, this is something that has to do with very serious, um, serious issue as a hate crime. But um, I would like to talk about, or about Islamophobia and the experiences um, also on a larger scale, right? So um, I was thinking about this, you know, from the... Um, from the perspective of policy, maybe there are most probably people who, who want to know what, what are things that we should be taking into consideration when we are drafting legislations and when we are doing policy work. Now, um, so one of the things that I have noticed in my work, which is something very important and the feedback that I'm getting from, from people is that um, the policy and the legislation, any measures taken by governments, uh, communities um, that deal with Islamophobia and Muslims, it should have an approach that considers the post-migration context that we are having currently in Europe. So this means that um, Muslim women, for instance, as a target of policy, they shouldn't anymore be considered um, only as part of integration policy or <laughs> integration programs. We are long over that, okay? And um, th this is something that uh, women in Finland are also very tired of. So in my opinion, there should be a differentiation. I mean, obviously there is a need for policy when we're talking about immigrants and immigrant women, different empowerment measures. But at the same time, if there is any kind of policy or measurement taken towards or to empower Muslim women, they should be considered um, maybe, um, in my opinion, a good idea would be just the, the general gender policy of the country, right? Or minority context, because we have, for example, countries such as Finland where minorities like Roma are taken into special consideration, right? So gender and minority context context is much more constructive in this manner, in my, um, in my um, expert opinion. Now, um, also here connected to this is that uh, the acknowledgement that Muslim women's experiences, they cannot always be categorized as uh, necessarily something that is related to ethnicity. We have been talking about intersectionality today a lot, right? However, you know, um, there there are still experiences that you cannot say that, okay, this is something that, you know, we can say that is based on, on vis visible ethnic background or visible even or, let's say, factual or perceived Muslimness. Um, there are Muslim women from, from different backgrounds in all around Europe and also in Finland. So we have, um, including also converts, right? So this is a whole other category of people who are experiencing Islamophobia on, on, on different levels. And we can't, always, uh, we can't always treat these experiences on the, on the same level, right? So um, we have also Muslim women who, they, like Muslim women, they relate to their faith um, on different levels, okay? 
So, um, for example, there are Muslim women, and these are not necessarily even a minority, who do not choose to wear any kind of what we might call religious clothing, right? So these Muslim women, they self-identify themselves just as much as Muslims, as those Muslim women who manifest their religion by their outer appearance, let's say, right? So um, these Muslim women, they feel the impact of Islamophobia just as much as any other Muslim women would, would feel. So if we're, for example, talking about legislation that puts, puts restrictions on wearing the religious clothing, women who do not wear the headscarf, they might not at that very moment be directly impacted by that legislation. That is true. However, when they are pondering, when they are thinking about possibly accessing their basic human rights in terms of religious freedom in the future, they might be considering um, taking on the headscarf, wanting to wear the veil. When they know that there are these kind of legislations, they feel just as attacked by the legislations as those women who are at that very moment uh, manifesting their religion visibly in the public space. So they feel this message from the society, your religious identity is not welcomed in the public space just as much as anybody else. So I think that oftentimes we forget when we're talking about policies and projects and measures that we forget also that there is that group of people as well and we should take their experiences into consideration just as much. Now, lastly, I want to note something. Um, it was just a while back, I think a month or so, when we had, um, again, a conversation about EU level, um, EU level uh, decisions in terms of whether headscarf is, um, whether the headscarf is uh, allowed at the workplace or not. And we have also today talked about this issue at many occasions. Now, I would really much like to see from the activist point of view and with the co cooperation with institutions, a critical review of the concept of neutrality. Because honestly speaking, I think that this is something very detrimental at the moment, that legislators, they seem to have somehow, neutrality seems to be some kind of a pet argument at the moment in order to draft these restrictions on the headscarf at the workplace, right? So what this does is that Muslim women, they are basically, we are creating this narrative that Muslim women who are wearing the headscarf, they are somehow automatically, inherently, ontologically, I don't know what it is, but they are somehow biased, unable to manifest a neutral behavior, neutral professional behavior. It is so insulting <coughs> to their intellectual capacities, right? So. For example, I think somebody talked about the law enforcement previously, right? So for example, in Finland, police women, they are not allowed to wear the headscarf. I think in the UK, this is possible. And as far as I know, in the Sweden, it is possible as well. In Finland, they are currently discussing the possibility of Muslim women wearing some sort of a headscarf as part of the uniform. So, however, previously, the argument has been that the headscarf cannot be worn because it is somehow obstructing the, or, or it, it's a hindrance for the professional behavior of the Muslim woman, right? So when we are here talking about gender Islamophobia, I think this is a perfect example because this neutrality argument, it literally puts Muslim women on such a lower level compared to their male counterparts because there is no such, no such legislation, no such argument that tells that a Muslim man couldn't be, you know, neutral in his professional behavior while we're looking at you know these arguments that are saying that oh yeah muslim woman when she wears the headscarf she's not neutral but when the muslim woman takes off her headscarf then suddenly she's neutral so i think this is very dangerous and i would say honestly i would just frankly say that the neutrality concept currently that we are using or i'm not using but many other people are using in the legislation um language it's racist and mm -hmm. it's it's discriminatory and we need to we need to do something about it so um these are um my notes based on um, my current work and previous work and i hope that they prompt some kind of discussion and i'm looking forward to to the next um, presentations and and um, interventions from other countries um, in europe thank you
thank you so much for those for those uh, for that intervention, Linda. I think it's really fascinating the point you bring up in particular around neutrality and how neutrality unfortunately can only apply to people that do not follow the Muslim faith or the Islamic faith and those who do for some reason immediately must uh, believe or will act in certain manners that is going to be in the opposite benefit of society. I think fundamentally this is a, it's a discussion that we have seen manifested through policy throughout and, and I think exactly in the manner that you refer to the Finnish context, much of it can be seen, of course, in the French context, much of it can be seen in the Belgian context as well, um, with the attempted hijab ban that took place in educational institutions last year. I think I feel as a as a as an organization we have we have seen we have seen some level of shifts to the positive side, but I do also feel um, that the neutrality argument, which was first, I think much of what was first exposed in the uh, in French political thinking, what has been exported across the, the union itself. And unfortunately, we need to counter that, uh, that, that, that dissemination of, uh, of, of policy with our own effective policies that are able to address the issue. Thank you so much, Linda. It's been, a, it's been great to hear your perspectives on, uh, on the Finnish context. I would now like to move on to um, Elif Adam. Um, Elif is the founder of uh, Dokkestella, which is an organization um, which seeks to counter Islamophobia and anti Muslim hatred um, in the Austrian context. It's not an organization that focuses solely on um, dealing it with it from an advocacy perspective, whilst actually dealing with it from a legal and jurisdiction perspective as well, where they're able to ensure that individuals that go through these issues are able to report to Dokkestella. And I'm sure she'll be able to explain it, um, explain the work the organization does. Um, very clearly, but we're very thankful to have um, Elif with us today, a practitioner and an expert um, who is t tackling the issue on the ground in a manner that is uh, really, really inspiring. Elif, please go ahead. Um, we can't hear you. Can you just... Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. So thank you, Sarah and thank you very much for the invitation to talk and give some um, some insights in our work and the outcomes of our work. Thank you very much. And I think it's it's pretty much very important to focus on gendered Islamophobia. And I'm very happy that um, you're doing it in that project. Just just not looking specifically on uh, Islamophobia, but on gendered Islamophobia. Um, so in ten minutes, I will try to. Um, try to um, give some insights on three different levels in Austrian contracts, like the data, uh, on terms of racism data, the discourses we have going on, and the legislation level. So uh, when I look back in our work, so I'm speaking of seven years of work, and Dokustelle is founded 2015 and presented its sixth uh, annual, annual report on anti-Muslim racism. And we see, of course, increasement, but it's increasement of reports, which doesn't mean it's increasement of incitements. It's a reported incitements from 158 to more than 1,400, including offline and online incitements. And when we look specifically, and we started looking specifically from the beginning um, on the gender, like who is actually a victim of, um, of anti-Muslim racism, and we see up to 97 percentage of victims are um, persons perceived as Muslim women. So it's up to 97 percentage, which it's highly quite a lot. Um, we, we just had last year difference. We had a number of more than 50 percentage of uh, man victims. And then we tried to figure out like this, this is quite striking. So why there is a lot of uh, man being victim of Islamophobia. Um, in the same time, we have quite a lot of women last years before our experiences. And then we saw that the mostly um, victims man are on, on online incitements. So we see a difference between online and offline. We see that in offline sp spheres, uh, Muslim women are much more targeted from anti-Muslim racism than uh, on online level. This could be, might have different explanations. It could be that the men are more involved in discussion on online discussions, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a sphere which could be make a research on it, which was very interesting. So the data is when we look like, okay, how are Muslim women um, 
but attacked, it's mostly insults in public. Yeah? So this is like insults on the street just by passing by, um, hate speech, like offline hate speech in the middle of a, uh, in the middle of a street, or as well hate crimes. And, and then we have some numbers on in school and working place, but we really have to say we have a problem of underreporting as in each other countries when it comes to working place and to school, since the people are very, very much afraid of consequences when, if they report today, their, uh, the issues. So um, when we see there is a gap, a very much gap between uh, man and woman being um, targeted from anti-Muslim racism. But the same, it's quite interesting for us as well to see when we go to community, because we try to make a community-based work, we go to like the mosques, to communities and say, please invite us so we can do some workshops on empowerment, on what's racism, how can I deal with racism, what can I do, what's my rights, and so on. So we got mostly forwarded to the women section inside. So we ended up mostly addressing the women in our community itself, even so it's actually not just an issue for, of, of Muslim women, it's an issue of the whole community and the whole society at large, actually. Um, the second one, we see always an increasement of peak data, peak reported incidents when we have um, political discourses, such as um, discourses on banning headscarf. So 2019, in April, we had a peak. And in October, we had a peak. In April, it was the starting of discussions from the political on media level about banning headscarf in kindergarten. In October, it was implementation of that ban. So we see that the legislation and all the discourses are explicitly um, influencing the daily life of Muslim women on the street which is very, very important. We have the same as well in, 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 in election campaigns. We saw each time when we had them that day, even on the day of election, we had a peak of reported, of reported um, cases. So this is for us seeing that it's very important which discourses are going on, on media level and on political level. And what we see is that the discourses are quite much on um, Muslim women, especially the meaning of headscarf, uh, what the headscarf means for, for, for Muslim women. But it's actually a paternalistic way of saying that the headscarf means it's a flag of political Islam and then trying to ban it. To say that this is not, this is not I mean, this is not a religious dress. It's a sign of political, uh, political opinion and then trying to ban it in using the neutrality, um, the neutrality law, which is actually doesn't make sense because it's the meaning itself is given by the politicians, and then the legislation is done by the politicians itself, and the Muslim women are actually totally out of the whole discussions. Um, what we have as well is um, we have a shift in how to address and how to speak about Muslim women. We could see over the, especially the first years, it was pretty much on saving Muslim women. And it shifted to, yeah, we have to save Muslim girls because they are innocent. We have to protect them from their, from their parents and shifted to, yeah, each hijabi, it's, um, it's actually a flag of political Islam. It's an advocator of political Islam. So it's a, it's a perpetrator itself. So we have a shift in the discussions, which is very, very interesting because we can see it on the daily life as well and discussions. And we see it as well in the legislation. What, um, what was interesting in 2020 was as well, we had a peak in November. November was a month quite hard and tough for us because we had the first Islamist terror attack in Austria. And then we had um, police raids in more than 60 Muslim households. And actually, I think all of them are right now as innocent. And then we have the starting of counterterrorism legislations, the discussion started. And we see that after November, specifically in November, we had quite a lot of inc uh, um, reported incidents. And we had a lot of women calling us and saying, I'm really afraid to go outside. I'm using the car to go outside. So they need to be empowered as well from within. Um, we, have, we have the whole discussion about gender equality. And on the political level, we see 
um, that the hijab is actually the nar the narrative of hijab is two, two things. Like first, it's a scarf of political symbol. It's a political symbol, and secondly, it's a threat for gender equality. But it's interesting that the same government was saying that the headscarf is a threat for gender equality. When we to look to their gender policies, we see that in the same year they actually uh, they, they had a, quite a lot of shortage in childcare allowance. We had we had the we had the short we had the um, decreasing of fundings of prevention of violence against Muslims going on on national level. So we have we have the government who's tried to save Muslim women and use this narrative and try to promote gender equality at the same time actually doing the opposite when it comes to policies. And um, that actually pretty much, and just one thing before I finish is that on legislation level, it's, it's really interesting in Austria that we started in two years, we had a lot of different um, bans coming. We had a ban of, uh, for, children in kindergarten, even so we don't have any data about how many, how many kids are really wearing headscarf in kindergarten. We had a very long discussion about that discourses. And then we had the ban in kindergarten. After not even a one year, we had to ban so the children in school till to 10 years. And at the same time, and this is very, very, very specific for Austria and not like it's different in Germany and other European countries is in Austria, it's specifically like kippah and patka are allowed at school, but except the hijab, it's forbidden. So even the neutrality thing is here totally not working because it based it not on neutrality, they base it on gender equality and they say, yeah, patka and kippah, it's not actually something again, it's not a threat for gender equality, but hijab is. And then we had a ban, and then we had discussions about banning headscarf for public officials. In the same time, we had the, um, we had the constitutional, just, uh, constitutional court who actually lifted the ban and said this is actually not um, in accordance with the constitution to say we are forbidden just for Muslim guilt, headscarf, but allowing everything else. So we had a very populist um, discourses and very populist legislations, even legislations with, but lifted afterwards from the constitutional court. But what's happening is the result is we have all the poisoned atmosphere in the society and we have all the narratives built from the political and media discourses and still in the society itself, which is, of course, affecting the Muslim woman on the street. And yeah, this is pretty much. And one thing I really hated when we speak about Islamophobia and put it to the right wing extremist parties. In Austria, we see that it's pretty much in the middle and on the left turn political spectrum, you can see as well quite a lot of Islamophobic narratives. So we're just not talking about right wing, we're talking about actually each political spectrum, we can find Islamophobia, especially gendered Islamophobia, even so in some feminist um, spheres. So thank you very much. Um, and there's quite a lot of things as well to tell, but I think this is quite enough to tell, to give an overview about what's going on in Austria. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alif. Um, yes, you are completely right. The 10 minutes is a difficult challenge to be able to provide um, an overview into the situation that Austrian Muslims find themselves in, but I think you did an incredible job. Um, particularly your points around how neutrality manifests there, I think is a fascinating one, especially as Linda mentioned um, previously in her points regarding the Finnish context. I think the point you make about how the world or the multitude of factors, whether it be violence that's committed on the streets of Austria, media narratives, political narratives, can all you know, create the monster that is Islamophobia that leads to real actions on the street, which leads to individuals being directly impacted by it through gendered Islamophobic attacks and actually how the online world people often forget about. But that is another area where anxiety and, 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 and actually real issues need to be addressed. And that's a responsibility, not just of policymakers, but also of tech institutions, which I'm sure you would completely agree with. And, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the work that Dr. Stella does in challenging this in Austria. And we look forward to, of course, working with you at every single opportunity uh, once again. And next, uh, I would like to introduce Ibrahim Rufi. Ibrahim is from the Al Fanar Foundation based in Spain, where he acts as the communications director. Alongside that, he is a journalist, an activist, and someone who has worked um, on 
um, be, be direct challenging of Islamophobia within the media structures and the media sphere itself. And um, he, I hope, will provide an interesting perspective on the work that Al-Fanar does and the work that he does in being able to challenge Islamophobia in this specific realm. Once again, thank you so much for joining us, Ibrahim. Thank you very much uh, to you and to the organization for, uh, for hosting us and inviting us for these events. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm very glad to be to be here today with you. I'm going to be, I uh, try to be very, very quick as well. Uh, even if, if it's uh, not easy. Um, uh, Al-Fanal Foundation uh, for Arab Knowledge is a non-profit organization uh, established in uh, 2012 uh, with a vast experience on the Arab world, aims to, uh, to understand uh, bridges between European and Arab societies um, with a solid expertise on policy advisory media analysis, uh, translating media uh, Arab digital newspapers into Spanish, uh, and working in different projects about hate speech, Islamophobia, uh, and uh, training programs. Uh, in the uh, in the year 2017, Alfanar uh, and other organizations such as uh, European Institute of the Mediterranean, uh, with the support of uh, Spanish Observatory of Racism and Xenophobia, and other sta stakeholders, uh, launched uh, the project I will I will introduce you about. Uh, is the Observatory of Islamophobia in Media uh, that happened in 2017. And as you may remember, that year was very uh, tragic to the uh, to Spain and to all Europe due to uh, terrorist attacks in Barcelona. Uh, when um, the media and the, the, the coverage of media was, was very uh, bad about this, uh, this situation, um, Islamophobia increased as always when it happens a terrorist attack and at that at that point at that moment uh, the the observatory of islamophobia in media uh, tried to uh, to arrive on, on that atmosphere or on that media atmosphere to uh, uh, to, to be uh, to be a space to be a, a project to work against islamophobia in uh, in the public uh, sphere the project uh, of the observatory a study and identify journalistic informa information that stigmatizes uh, muslims uh, offer trainings to faculties and schools uh, of journalism and communication around the uh, all spain uh, make recommendation observatory has created the first uh, guidelines to write about islam muslims uh, for journalists um, we in, uh, in our website, we study and also identify good practices for a more inclusive and accurate journalistic narrative that fosters and respects interculturality and avoids generalization that stigmatize Muslim community. Um, uh, we publish monthly qualitative analyses and quarterly statistics. We publish an annual report. Uh, next month, we'll publish uh, report in, uh, observatory of islamophobia in media 2000, 2020 um, uh, we also train uh, uh, journalists and we we are now working in in a project called uh, agenda of uh, uh, media diversity where we try we will try to to bring together the muslim organizations and the muslim uh, uh, active citizens in spain with the uh, Spanish uh, uh, Spanish uh, national uh, newspapers and media in general, who has a very, very big uh, lack of uh, representation of diversity in, in, the, in their teams. Uh, we work also in a network with similar projects that work in, uh, in other European countries and um, we work in uh, within a, a methodology that uh, is updated uh, annually. Uh, the, the, the project has generated uh, in Spain greater awareness of Islamophobia, at least among journalists. Uh, and we can see that according to the statistics, the first year when observatory uh, appeared and was created, uh, 
uh, uh, 60, more than 60% of uh, everything that was written about Muslims was Islamophobic. And uh, now the, uh, it's, uh, it's 30% less. Uh, of course, there is a lot of uh, work to, to, to be done. There is a lot of uh, uh, projects and there is a lot of uh, initiative that, that may be um, launched uh, around this issue, um, especially media. Uh, as we understand, media is uh, one of the of the main sources of Islamophobia and uh, creating uh, opinion uh, for 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 public uh, uh, speech. And uh, this this field, we need to cover it and we need to to work on it. Uh, and uh, I I don't want to take uh, more time. Uh, you can you can have more information about the work we are we are doing in our website. And also, you can contact me if you have more questions. And I really, uh, I really thank you. I thank the organization for this uh, for this event and and all the participants for your job, the, the job that you're you're doing, which is very important in in our societies nowadays. Thank you very much. Brian, thank you so much for that. Thank you for your kind words at the end. We are very very happy to have worked with Alphanov for a very long time and we of course could hope to continue working the specific work that Alphanov does is really important in being able to challenge media organizations and institutions to ensure that their coverage of Muslim communities and actually of migrant communities altogether is fair and I think of course we exist in a time where all, all people want are retweets and, uh, and more viewers on their channels and unfortunately Muslims have been scapegoated as the method to be able to gain those viewers and to gain those retweets but through the work of Alphanar and other organizations, we are seeing hopefully some changes and we look forward to working with you, supporting with you and engaging with you um, as, of course, uh, time continues. And thank you so much for your, for your really interesting remarks, Ibrahim. Um, moving on and uh, to end, um, I'd like to, of course, thank uh, all of our panelists who have been really, who gave fascinating insights into the national and local uh, context um, of challenging Islamophobia, gender Islamophobia in particular. <clears throat> and from a practical perspective, um, I really recommend for those of you from the countries that were spoken about, either Austria, Finland or Spain, or not, uh, please do have a look at the websites of those uh, different organizations to see the work that's being done and see if you can maybe even replicate it um, on a local or national level, because this type of work is often done underfunded and uh, undervalued and more than ever, we need uh, reactions from civil society actors, we need reactions from activists and actors to ensure that this work is uh, taken forward. And I'm very, very lucky and privileged to have engaged with these individuals before, and I look forward to engaging with them and continuing the work against gender Islamophobia on a local and national level. Um, and that brings us to the closing remarks of the event. Very lucky to have Zangun back on stage again to provide those closing remarks. We made an active effort to ensure that a Muslim woman started and ended the event. For us as an organization, we are very clear, it's not about, uh, it's not about speaking on behalf, but actually providing the mic to and the platform to Muslim women to be able to reclaim their own narratives. Therefore, I will start up soon. Um, I have a couple of quick notices, if that's okay. As mentioned, Prior to the break, there is an event going on at 1.30 today, um, challenging, uh, uh, challenging Islamophobia and the methods in which organizations and civil society organizations are using that. The, the registration link I will post once again. There is another event taking place from the 24th to the 26th um, held by FADV focused on in, uh, international youth forum against Islamophobia. The link will once again be posted in the Zoom and will be sent to all of the attendees as well. For those of you that have uh, that may not necessarily see the, the chat itself, very important to attend. There will be English and Italian simultaneous translation, and it will be an interesting forum where debates, discussions, and keynotes will take place where this issue of Islamophobia can be addressed from a youth perspective. Like we said, it's not about speaking on behalf of the youth, but it's about allowing the youth to have their own opportunities to co-create policy with one another. Um, before I pass it over to Zamzam, I'd like to thank all of our speakers and panelists um, and thank you for all of you for attending so far and I'll pass it to Zamzam to provide those uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, zoom, zoom, zoom. And I'm, I'm, I'm back to um, close this incredibly important um, conference. And first of all, I guess I want to thank by uh, FEMSO um, and all the other partners who have made this event possible. Those of you that have attended, all the panelists and have contributed um, on this very incredibly, incredibly important topic. And I think attending like events right now has, has already been, we've all got Zoom fatigue and like these hybrid conferences are always um, unusual and uncomfortable, but I think really, really important and commend you all for being here. And I can look around, look, see that you're all sincere about the work that, um, and, and, and tackling Islamophobia. And, um, but actually the reality is we need far more than sincerity to tackle Islamophobia. We need to act, we need actual action to tackle the problems at hand. Um, and so there must be a genuine commitment from all of us, those of us, those of us uh, on, the, on the live stream and those of us here physically in the room, um, to commit each and every one to tackling Islamophobia um, experienced and defined by Muslim communities. Because the reality is Islamophobia is a direct threat. It quite literally ends lives, it cripples bodies and it destroys families. And I've seen how this impacts communities firsthand. Um, it is a fundamental issue that isn't sufficiently recognised and it isn't tackled by any governments or institutions um, and it isn't on, on the agenda anywhere and actually discussing it often almost is seen as not worth the political capital. Um, and to me it's, it's quite embarrassing that we have loud leaders amongst our myths, um, leaders and, and, and who don't even recognise the extent of how Islamophobia plagues our very societies. Islamophobia divides our societies, it marginalizes our communities, and it threatens the very democracies that we fight for and fight to protect. Islamophobia isn't this theoretical, theoretical problem or this mere ideology that's far away, right? It is a fundamental um, issue that alters the lives of people and, and affects those um, suffering from it. And the challenge is the challenges that we have ahead of us are multitude. I mean, I could sit here for hours and, 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 and really tell you about the, how these issues play out in societies and, 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 and how um, we are fundamentally, by not taking action, a big part of the problem. Um, and so to me, it's important if we, if we believe in our European values and we believe in, in advising for justice and tackling any institutional issues that exist in our society, then really understanding the role that we play in, in making that in that making that pivotal change, and so um, in an anti-European, anti-institutional age where nationalism is becoming the new norm, and we choose to believe, and we need to choose to believe in civil societies and our institutions and the capacity, and, and choose to protect um, the vulnerable and guarantee their safety and their equal rights as every in, every single inhabitant um, in Europe. Uh, and I hope that we all recognise that. I hope we all share that same values um, to fight for that. And as current and as future leaders of Europe, that we fight um, this evil out of our society. And so the power to shape this continent uh, to an inclusive and to a diverse and a welcoming home for all of us lies in our very grasp. And, and we have an important and fundamental role to play in that. And I honestly believe that together we can achieve that. Um, and honestly, I don't, from, from my very perspective, is that I, I don't, I, I don't want to believe that. I know that we can achieve that, right? We know fundamentally if we put in the work um, and do that, but move forward together, um, we can be a cohesive and stronger European country and, and a nation. Um, so I want to thank you all for, 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 for inviting me. I want to thank again um, the organizers of this event for allowing me to participate. Um, and I hope a call of action to all of you to, to actively make changes in your society and, and root out Islamophobia in every, in every corner of this continent. Thank you for inviting me. And as I've said, that brings us to an end of the EU policy talks, Islamophobia, Day Against Islamophobia Symposium, tackling gender and Islamophobia in particular. Um, organized by Project Meet. Please do visit the Project Meet website, which is part of the invitations and can be seen. Uh, following this event, we will send along um, the Project Meet brochure and, uh, and, and links to the work that we're doing as a, as, a, as a project and the work of our partners, which we are very lucky to have. Uh, it has been an excellent discussion. We've had discussion points and actually interventions from MEPs, from the Commission of Equality, from local civil society activists and from important stakeholders tackling this issue. We look forward to seeing the work um, that we all achieve together on this incredibly important topic. 
And as Zamzam said at the very beginning, the time for talk is over, the time to act is now. And I thank you so much for your attention and your attendance. Thank you so much. Thank you.